Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Preventing Phishing 2.0 Attacks with Next Generation Security Defense. This event is brought to you in partnership with Slash Next and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media and I'm excited to be your moderator for this event. We encourage questions on this event. You should use the questions box. It's on the left hand side of your audience console and we'll be doing our best to answer those questions throughout the event. We also encourage you to check out the handouts tab where you can find out additional information on the slash next solution. And finally, if you're watching this event live, we will be announcing the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card at the end of the presentation. If you're watching on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. And with that, I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenters. They are Mr. Patrick Haar, Chief Executive Officer at Slash Next, and Mr. Paul Guerrera, Chief Security Officer at the Argo Group. And with that, Let's get started. Paul and Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure, thank you. So we're talking today about the next generation of phishing prevention, phishing prevention 2.0, if you will. And we're just gonna have a fireside chat here. I'm excited to hear from Paul, who is a, a customer of Slash Next and a chief security officer. He's out in the field uh, and he's dealing with these kind of threats every day. So. You know, let's kick it off with our first question, and that is, what's changed, Paul, in the, the phishing landscape out there? What's happening at your organization? What are you seeing? Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, we, we still see phishing as one of the number one risks that are out there. It has one of the highest success rates. It's also the easiest to deploy. So phishing was a big topic two, three years ago, and it, it's still relevant today. The thing is, with COVID, over the last several months, we have seen a increase of 200 to 600% in the industry, just depending on, on what sector that you're, you're currently in. Um, we are seeing attacks and they are increasing, but a lot of the basic tools and capabilities are, are protecting us. However, we're seeing a lot of our SMB partners uh, and, and smaller vendors that don't have the right technologies in place. They may not have a full IT department. And they may not have a full security department, those are the ones really getting getting impacted. But we are seeing some of the bad actors using the same tactics, the same approaches that we've seen before. Now they're just, you know, they're they're interweaving COVID, some of the political things that are out there, some of the social events that are out there. And you know, whatever's in the in the news this week, that's what they're leveraging. They're hoping people are going to go and click on those. So uh, we're re really focusing our time and energy is how do we train and keep our third parties and even our fourth parties aware and, you know, um, you know, being more careful. So. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a scary time. Uh, Patrick, what are you seeing? Yeah, it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, obviously as Paul highlighted, we've seen a, a few different trends happen, uh, particularly obviously with this shift to, uh, to remote working, remote learning. Um, we have a, what we would characterize as the world's largest phishing database. And in that database, uh, we've seen a, just a significant increase. Uh, in fact, COVID-related attacks have been a 3,000% increase uh, since March 15th. Uh, so not only are we seeing these, these attacks, but we're also seeing the sophistication of these attacks uh, move beyond email. Uh, I, I think everyone thinks of email and phishing somewhat synonymous, and they think of it uh, in many respects as a personal email problem. Um, if you've ever had the, the pleasure to, to uh, see the social uh, dilemma, uh, you see the, the fact that these bad actors, uh, or you see the, the social networks have the opportunity to use supercomputing techniques, AI techniques to actually target users and manipulate those users. Uh, we're seeing that exact same thing on the phishing side where you have just mass amount of compute power out there and the ability to hijack algorithms, basically target the weakest link, which are users. And uh, as Paul noted, the, the number one security threat is phishing. And so with that, we're seeing these phishing attacks, not only in email, but we're seeing dramatic rise in SMS. Uh, in fact, we saw two to 13% increase this year, seeing an increase in social networking channels. Uh, when Twitter got taken down six weeks ago by the 14 year old, that was a Bitcoin scam that we saw uh, literally in the middle of 2019. Uh, we see rogue browsers, software extensions, um, you know, housing phishing attempts. 
And we've also seen in collaboration services like Zoom. Um, I'm sure your kids are on Zoom, uh, but also workers, right? And so you're seeing these embedded attacks all over the place. Bottom line, as I, as I like to say, you have to really fight now machines with machines. And because uh, that's, that's really what these bad actors are doing. They're targeting it to you and they're, they become very sophisticated and they're doing it across all these channels. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, great points. A 3000% increase. That's just, uh, just unbelievable. And you make a great point. We have to do more than just tell our end users, Hey, don't click the link, right? We, we have to do better than that. So, I mean, uh, Paul, I'll take this back to you. What, what are you seeing around mobile devices and endpoint targeting? Yeah, so we, we are do, we are seeing an increase in voice and in text, um, and, and as Patrick noted, uh, social media is increasing as well. Uh, email is still the number one that, you know, that at least that we're seeing internally. And one of the things that we focused on is we're we're trying to understand why are people clicking, and what what we found out um, kind of just through our research is there's four main categories. So number one that makes up about fifty percent of those cases for these repeat clickers is performance management. So it's it's part of a larger issue, but sometimes you have employees that maybe are clicking a little too much, but there's a there's a strong correlation. They're in sales, maybe they're not hitting their sales goals. Maybe they're not hitting other goals or other other things that the company is is really focused on. So that's not the job of the security officer. Um, so we put that back on HR and on the managers, please performance manage. So that that's number one with 50%. The, the other piece is being distracted. Um, so I think we're all guilty of this. We're watching TV, the game is on, and we're on our phones and rolling through and we're looking at Facebook, we're looking at Instagram, we're looking at whatever else. And sometimes you're mindlessly just scrolling, right? So what happens is that's your work, that's your, that's your personal, but then you have your work and you take those same bad habits into your work email. And sometimes people are on a Zoom call or they're doing something else or listening to someone and they're just scrolling through their mobile device and they're not really thinking. So one of the things that we, we train our, our employees on is uh, you have to be, when you're in your email, be 100% attentive, be mindful. Sometimes you have to stop, pause and think, take five seconds. And before you click on that link and you take that five seconds, sometimes you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get that feeling. It's like, I don't know if that feels right. And that's what we're looking for people to really do is change that behavior. And sometimes that's, that's difficult to do. So we want people to think of their inbox is risk. Anytime you log into it, that is a risk that is being presented to you, not just at work, but also at home as well. So it's that behavioral change. So that's around 25%. Uh, there's about 15% that we see that, look, they're just not technically savvy. I think of my parents, they're in their mid seventies. They're, they're not technically savvy, you know, uh, they're okay on their phones, but you know, there's, you know, when, when it comes to example to their bank, uh, they walk into the bank still, they don't do anything online. They may have, they may use their ATM card, but they still write checks. Right. So my, my, my parents are afraid that they're going to click on the wrong link and someone is going to drain their bank account. So what we went and did, we walked down to the bank and we removed online access for them. Now they don't have to worry about it. So now the same thing persists with our employees as well. If you have somebody in the claims department or finance department, how do you give them the minimum technology needed for them to be successful in their current role? No more, no less. And a lot of times, you know, for, for some companies, they don't make that a part of the hiring process. That should be something that we're looking for. And it's that there's the minimum bar, let's, let's aim for something a little bit higher uh, whenever we hire the next round of employees. Uh, so that's about 15%. And the last percentage, the last 10% is people that are just not security conscious. They're well-intentioned. They're good people. They just haven't had the right amount of security training. And sometimes the online training that we do isn't enough. Maybe you have to do it in person. And maybe some people learn in different ways. So by asking questions or more visually. So we're, we're coming up with different ways to educate people to help with that last 10%. And what we've what we've been finding out is a little goes a long way with that last demographic. Excellent points. I mean, this uh, principle of least privilege that we've heard about, you know, for years in security, it really needs to be applied kind of across the board. Uh, you make a point of removing access to things that people don't really need access to, and then being mindful when they're using email and, and mobile devices. Um, Patrick, what's your take? 
Well, it is pretty interesting. I, I just before we uh, got on this call, I was actually uh, lamenting a little bit how my uh, my daughter every once in a while takes my 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 business device uh, because we're all working from home, we're learning from home, and she uses it right. And, and so, lo and behold, I see some Chrome, uh, you know, uh, Google Chrome uh, browser extensions, and all of a sudden, my machine starts going crazy. Um, and, and so I think this is a pretty big point as we see right now, particularly on the mobile side and, and this remote working, remote learning on your PC or your Mac. And, and that is that, as Paul noted, it's almost like in the same 15 minutes, you go between your work email to your personal email over to Facebook Messenger, back into Zoom. You go into if someone has to message you, and next thing you know, they've lost that attention. Uh, I think as Paul, as you noted, um, and, and that's the danger, right? And the second aspect here, yes, yes, people try to do uh, computer-based training, right, to target, and, you, and we typically see this, the top three to 5%, uh, you always see the same people clicking, right, the, the, in, within the uh, corporation. That's the reason why we like to give that information of who's clicking, what department, et cetera. But what we do find in the computer-based training, like with any computer-based training, once you take it, you somewhat go away. Right, and you okay? Okay, so there was that thing they made me do. I then come back six months later, and I take it again, and lo and behold, I click on something. Uh, so we also find that it's very important to do live computer, not rather than do computer-based training, live reinforcement. And that's what we do in our product. So it's a combination of number one, we're seeing just a obviously a dramatic increase in in this click behavior because of this convergence of your work personal life together. Uh, driven by remote working, remote learning. But second, we're really seeing the importance of being able to do live reinforced training so we can help people uh, really avoid these these mistakes that are happening. And I'd like to say, and I heard this actually from another sis, so I'll borrow this. It only takes one bad fish <clears throat> to do significant damage. And the final point I would uh, make here, and this came from a, a, another customer I was talking to, is that back to this, business, personal life together, uh, they were noticing that they were having backdoor attacks into the corporate network through the personal Android devices. And uh, again, by putting our software, our service in place, they're able to prevent those. So I guess the long and short of it, really you have to be careful of this, this combination effect that's occurring out in the market, which is again, your business, personal life together. Um, and then make sure, again, you're really doing live reinforced training and what you're really focused on with your users, just given the susceptibility. Yeah, you, you make great points there. I mean, we're all working from home. Our, our personal devices and work devices have merged into one. And now our, our work environment and home environment has merged as well. And, you know, we're, we're doing work. It's, it feels like 24-7 some days. And it's, it's tough to stay mindful all the time and not, you know, yeah. get distracted. Um, I'm curious, uh, Paul, you know, back to you, uh, this question, when folks are working from home, all this remote working these days, what have you seen change? Yeah, a couple of things. And, and, and I think Patrick hit, hit the first one pretty well, uh, making sure that employees are using their laptop for work purposes only. It's not the kid's laptop. It's not the family laptop. Sometimes it's the only one that's in the in the house, you know, so we had to splurge a little bit and, you know, we got the kids iPads because we thought that was going to be, that was going to be great. And then it wasn't supported. So we had to then get them Chromebooks. So now, now we got four extra devices uh, that, you know, that we have to worry about. So it's, uh, you, know, you know, that's, that's one of them. The other one is making sure that you're aware of your, your company's work from home policy. Uh, you know, so that means always, you know, if you're going to access customer information and uh, employee information, always use VPN, always use Citrix, um, always make sure you're on multi-factor, you know, you're using multi-factor authentication, fingerprinting when, when needed. Uh, so I, I think, I think those are helpful. Uh, the other thing that we do is, you know, most people's Wi-Fi is they use their default Wi-Fi passcode. Also their router is probably admin admin for, for a lot of people. So we always tell people work with your network provider and see if you can change those, those default settings. It's, those are very helpful. Uh, for some of our roles, we still require printing, um, unfortunately. So what we don't want people doing is printing out sensitive information and then, okay, recycle is on Wednesday and let me take all those files and put them out there the night before. So anybody walking by can go and get those. 
how do you shred those properly? How do you dispose of that that information in a in a secure secure manner? So those are some of the ones that we that we require that we call best practices. And the other part is we talked about vendors earlier, making sure that all of our vendors are adhering to those same same pieces. And not just a head nod, but that's actually written in the in the contracts going forward. Right. And those are part of the you know quarterly business reviews as well, especially during this time. Absolutely. Yeah. Great advice. And I mean, I know um, Patrick mentioned training, the, the value of in-person training over just, you know, sending out links to, to a CBT to the employees. Um, Paul, what have you seen around the value of training when it comes to security and preventing phishing? Yeah. So I, I think on the, on the training side, there, there's some basics. It's the online training. That's your compliance checkbox exercise once a year. Uh, we also do monthly phishing campaigns. Some people do it annually, some people do it quarterly, but we've got some um, significant results by doing it you know, on a quarterly basis. Implementing a phishing alert button that makes it simple and easy. It's right there on your phone or it's right there on your, you know, on, on your desktop. It's easy to report those out. And then we come up with monthly newsletters. Could be about password, could be about, you know, safely mm -hmm. uh, securing your laptop. We come up with something different every every month holidays are right around the corner so you know it's it's a lot of, a lot of the holiday scams and, and things to be prepared for so and i think those are the basics but in reality what we're trying to do is build a security culture and you have to do that in a couple of different ways you have to build it top down and you also have to build that bottom up and part of that is as as CISOs and as leaders um, we have to understand that sometimes um, different stories resonate with different people and we're educators so to educate people sometimes you have to be a good a good storyteller and part of that means is you have to know your audience so i think about the board i think about c-level i think about um, general leadership and then employees so what resonates really well with the board is talking about accountability so we educate them and we walk them through the target breach from several years back and uh, i we, you know we won't go through that here but a lot of that had to do with what is the oversight needed from a board of directors to make sure you have a strong and resilient security program. What are the right questions to ask? What are the right metrics to look at? But making sure that everybody is, is held accountable in that case. When we talk about our C-level, it's if there is a data breach, what is the impact to reputation? What's the impact to the bottom line? You know, sometimes a breach can hurt trust and that confidence that the company has built over many, many years. When we talk to VPs at leadership level, um, what, what I love showing is our phishing metrics by VP. So we show the heroes and we show the zeros, right? These are in green, these are in yellow, these are in red. And I just put up the slide and yeah, there, there's just really good conversation that goes on. Right after those presentations, um, within an hour, I get four or five requests to go present at their, at their next town hall. So it, it, it always works, works out very well. And then on the employee side, uh, part of that is it's the education piece, telling employees why it's important. And I, and I think one of the things that have, that's been most successful for me is making those parallels between their home, their family, their kids, their parents, their grandparents, and then work. It's the same controls, it's the same risk, it's the same thing. And if we can help educate and, and keep their family safe, they're going to also in turn make the company safe as well. Yeah, excellent <clears throat> points all around there. Um, and you make a great point about how different types of employees need different levels of training. You know, the executives need uh, a different form of training than just the frontline workers who might have access to only a, a simple email box. And that executive, you know, compromise is just such a dangerous threat these days. Um, Patrick, I wanted to ask you about you know, next generation uh, phishing pre uh, prevention and protection. I mean, traditionally, phishing security uses a domain reputation, URL inspection, and specialized security researchers to try to prevent these, you know, kind of phishing attacks. But I know that for a lot of companies out there, that's really tough to, to implement. Um, so what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, so clearly, as I, as I noted at the outset, we've seen a pretty significant shift in, in the phishing landscape. Um, what I'd characterize moving from 1.0, which is human 
static, uh, more of the human forensics reputation based uh, approach to looking at phishing. What I mean by that is that Google.com establishes a, a reputation over time. But as we've seen in, in GC and Google Cloud as an example, they are, they're hosting 50,000 uh, phishing attacks right now. And it's because they're nested inside the reputation, right? So I, what, uh, again, coming back, we've seen a really a, a pretty significant elevation or change from 1.0 to what I'd characterize 2.0. And this is now using AI techniques. As I highlighted, the bad actors have all the public cloud compute resources out there in the world. They've got these different algorithms they can use. And that means they can now target you with AI specific approach, uh, which means you're more susceptible, not less susceptible. And second, as I noted, we're seeing these attacks move well beyond just email, right? And SMS and the social channels and, and gaming. Uh, I could even I search in advertising. Um, it's really pretty significant uh, in terms of their broad specter that they're, they're driving. So we believe fundamentally that you have to, as I, as I noted, fight machines with machines. You have to bring AI to bear here. So you have automated behavioral learning of when these bad actors are putting up their phishing attacks, you can detect them and prevent them before they happen. And I did a little bit of back of the envelope math here uh, to apply what we do. We would have to hire about 20,000 data scientists, right? Just think of the, the cost of that. Now, now think of that impact downstream with uh, large and small companies. There's no way you can actually do that. And so the only way you can, uh, I believe now that you can successfully prevent these attacks from happening is to use AI. Uh, um, and that's fundamentally what we set out to do is how do you bring computer vision, natural processing, behavioral analysis? How do you look at preemptive techniques? So when they register a, a domain, they don't necessarily go live. They wait 60 days, 90 days. So how do you follow them through that, that chain process to when they go live? And then again, how do you prevent those uh, before they before they happen? Again, the only way we know how to do that, and I believe fundamentally in the industry knows how to do that is through AI. Uh, I'd say the final thing here, uh, which I think is important, is coming back, uh, just the, the importance of stopping phishing. As I said, it only takes one to get through the deuce does significant damage. Phishing is the beginning, and Gartner even noted this, uh, over 90% of all external attacks start with phishing. So whether it's ransomware, whether it is data exfiltration, whether it's IP theft, whether it is wire fraud, right, all this starts with some form of phishing, uh, credential stealing or scareware tactics, et cetera. And so that's the reason why you now need to protect yourself with, again, that 2.0 phishing protection, AI techniques, because uh, otherwise, you, I, I don't think you can simply uh, keep, uh, keep up with this. Absolutely. I mean, I love this idea of fighting computers with computers, using AI uh, against these malicious attackers. Um, Paul, what are you doing at the Argo Group for kind of this next generation of phishing prevention? Yeah, great, great question. And uh, so part of it, I, I think, right to Patrick's point, is like the, the, the playing field is not level. These bad actors are getting smarter. As you mentioned, they have unlimited resources. They got to be successful once. You know, as a CISO, I have to deal with technical debt, poor IT hygiene, limited resources, sometimes budget, and I have to be successful 100% of the time. Look, those aren't great odds. I don't know anybody that would go like, like all in on that hand, right? So we have to be innovative. We have to figure out how do we change our odds a little bit so the house doesn't always win. And part of that is partnering with, with companies and like Slash Next to bring AI and machine learning to that forefront, right? And that, that's one of the many things that we have to do. Part of that is if we have that solution, we have optimized processes, and then we have to look at the human element as an opportunity or an advantage, not just a risk, right? Because we know there's a risk portion, but I know the technology is going to capture this much. I know the process is going to capture this much, and that last portion I'm really focused on the people part of it. So, we, you know, we talked about training um, a little bit, and I think that training that, that we mentioned, that's more of the floor, not, not the ceiling. And Patrick mentioned kind of these in-person sessions. Well, we do some of those. Uh, we try to make them fun, exciting. We try to make their, them interactive. Um, 
And we, you know, we call them more events. We bring snacks, we bring beer, we bring wine. And we, you know, it, it's an interesting topic, you know, and sometimes people are afraid to ask a couple simple questions and everyone's just quiet in the audience. And we've done these in uh, our New York office, London office, Bermuda office, Brazil office, and it's really quiet. Uh, so I always, I always throw out some icebreakers and I said, who thinks Alexa or Siri is listening to them? And then you get all these people jumping in and asking questions. Who trusts Facebook? Who has ever been on Facebook and you see a pop-up ad right after you mentioned that to your significant other or someone in your family? And that kind of gets the conversation going. Anyways, we end up going two hours and people just have some basic questions to ask and, you know, and we tie it to their family. We tie it to their personal life, right? Uh, we also give them a little bit of homework, right? So we say there's a, we always, we always mention there's this video on Netflix called The Great Hack. And it really talks about data warfare. Talks a little bit about the last presidential election and then what's going on with Brexit and how data warfare has been used for hundreds of years, but now it's for sale, right? And, and for some of these companies. Uh, we also show them a video of the Facebook FTC settlement video that has some very eye-opening um, findings by the FTC. So when we talk about data privacy, data breaches, how do we keep our information and data data secure? Uh, one, of, one of the things that we're looking to implement in the next, uh, in the next year or so, it's kind of a training 2.0 to accompany kind of the slash next kind of 2.0 piece. And part of that is, is not basic training, but everyone's been to an escape room or have heard of them. Well, there's a company called Living Security they do a cybersecurity escaper. So everyone's looking for team events and you know we've had happy hours, we've had morning coffee, but to do a, an event that can bring a team together during this time is great. And also get a little security training and makes it fun and different. One of the things they also do is a family first series. Uh, they're two minute videos and they talk about how do you keep, keep your kids safe online? How do you keep them safe when they're gaming? So just those two, three minute videos give parents a really good way to protect their children, you know, their, their number one asset, right? And I think if we can start to build that, that uh, and instill that culture from an employee and a family perspective, that's easily a very easy to carry on to the work environment as well. Wow, how exciting. I love this idea of making security education fun and interesting and personal as well. I mean, a friend of mine, his, his baby pictures were his family's baby pictures were actually held for ransom. And I mean, there's just so many personal uh, attacks when it comes to phishing and ransomware happening. Um, this has got to be affecting uh, everyone's life, you know, whether it's work or personal. Um, let's move on to the next question here. Uh, I want to ask you this, Patrick, what do you think is on the horizon when it comes to using AI to prevent phishing? Yeah, I, I previewed a little bit of this uh, in, the, in the last question. Um, so as again, as I noted, uh, with the just dramatic decrease in compute power, right, uh, or compute costs, I should say, and the dramatic rise in compute power, you now have these uh, these bad actors be able to take advantage of that to, to target not only, I would say, global attacks of phishing aspects, but now targeted attacks so that we've seen in our labs, and I'm sure, Paul, you've seen this even firsthand, that they're now starting to tar target you as a singular individual or a set of, or a small group of individuals. And the reason why they're able to do that, they're, they're able to look at the behavioral aspects going on. They, back to this point of all that data is out there, they can somewhat get uh, some aspects, some data, whether it be in LinkedIn, happened at the last company. Company. They, as soon as uh, they saw I was a CEO there, they then uh, saw that a, a new marketing person came in and lo and behold, there was some text that came in that said, hey, go uh, send Patrick uh, gift cards at the uh, VM World Trade Show. And they obviously went to the wrong uh, person and that was about $15,000. That's a small aspect, but that's an example of targeted personal phishing attacks that are coming only to you. And again, that's because of this just dramatic decrease in the cost of a compute and the rise in the power of compute and the behavioral aspects that you can uh, gather out there. So I think it, what is very, very critical to understand here is that these attacks are gonna, not only growing in sophistication, uh, but they're growing in targeted attacks. And the more information that they can gather on you, the more 
app, they're going to be able to get you to do something. Because if I look, I know Paul has a Wells Fargo bank account. I know he lives in this particular region. He may like even like the sports team. There's there's different things that they can gather about you to then try to trick you into doing something. And that's really what phishing is. It's an attempt to get you as that user to do act on behalf of something, whether share your credentials like the last election that Paul brought up. That's how all the information got out there. Or it's to give those credentials to go access bank accounts. Um, that's what they're going to do. And I think that's the biggest nearer and longer term threat is those targeted attacks specifically to you that really incorporates all this information about you out there. And again, it may not just be you, it could be your group, it could be your finance team, it could be your marketing team, it could be your HR team. Uh, let me just give you one other example. I just came up with another company that I've been working with, but uh, the head, the chief development officer lost 10 months of his salary. Half of it was going uh, to a bad actor because they were able to target HR with some specific information about him. Uh, somehow we're able to extract some uh, credentials uh, hijack the system and then start redirecting half the salary. So those are again, just examples of these personal attacks. And that's the reason why you have to take this proactive, prevent these attacks from happening before they happen. Um, it, nothing is, is, is fail, you know, fail safe. I think as Paul was just going through, that's the reason why you have to have a multi-layered approach, right? You have to have technology, you do have to have processes and you have to have this training. And I think that's fundamentally important but you also now have to bring AI techniques to fight these, again, back to this fighting machines with machines, so you can prevent these attacks from happening before they happen. Uh, and second, if they obviously, back to this, this training side, I, I did want to make one final point here. We're also a big believer here of providing reporting uh, out um, by these different groups. So we have a VIP section, right? So you can actually look who are in the VIP world is actually clicking on things. So you can help them reinforce, again, back the training, be careful, um, back to this targeted behavioral analysis that, that we are seeing. Uh, we also have the ability to do alerting if they are targeting accounting or finance. So I think you're gonna have to continue to take a multi-layered approach, uh, an AI approach to stopping these targeted attacks, but recognize they're not gonna stop. They're gonna get more sophisticated, not less sophisticated. And you need to bring that front line of defense. Do not be complacent about this, regardless of what product out there that you look at. Do not be complacent because it only takes that one to do that significant damage. Excellent advice. Very well said. Um, I know we're running out of time here in our event. Um, Paul, any last words or final advice before we wrap up? Uh, the the only thing is kind of that, uh, as Patrick mentioned, that gap between bad actors and a CISO is growing every year, right? So you do need to be able to fight machines with machines. They're getting better at spoofing, you know, developing malware that can adapt to the current controls I have in place, Identi you know, identify vulnerabilities even faster than before. So, you know, I, I think that needs to be a uh, a play in every CISO's playbook, you know, with a lot of the tools and processes and the people you have to have machine learning and uh, AI is, is a part of that roadmap, so. Excellent. Well, Paul, thank you so much for sharing your story from the Argo Group. We appreciate it. Thank you. And Patrick, thank you so much for telling us about what's uh, new with Next Generation Phishing Protection uh, from Slash Next. Uh, thanks for being on. And with that, let's go ahead and wrap up. I wanna thank everyone out there in our audience for joining us today. Uh, you can learn more about Next Generation Phishing Protection uh, and download a free trial at slashnext.com. Uh, it's a free 14-day trial. Uh, just go visit slashnext.com. Uh, and again, thank you so much to Paul Guerrero from the Argo Group and uh, have a good day.